So this is a case of knife or death. Um, we'll go through the case. We're going to have a couple of education points. Um, we have no disclosures, although we do wish we did. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Um, all of our uh, objectives so that everybody can get our CEUs. Um, so just as a little disclaimer, you know, your discretion is advised. There's going to be a couple of pictures in here, but I think we all are uh, pretty used to that stuff. So first come first, uh, this call that I'm presenting or that we're presenting uh, occurred just about a year ago from today. Um, it was my first shift working with a partner that I'd never worked with before that wasn't really familiar with the Florida area. He's kind of a float guy that um, comes in to help fill some shifts. And we were dispatched to this call around noon. So we're going to play a couple of um, audio clips here. Nine one one. What is the address of the emergency? Oh, is this a house? I'm sorry, what? Is this a house? Is this a house? Yeah. Too loud, you guys. Okay, tell me exactly what happened to your son. Okay, I that Yes. Okay, Are you there with him? Is that him crying? Yes. Okay, All right, sir, with that rescue on the way. My name is Andrea. What's your name? Last one here. Attack Bravo Engine Seven One. Traumatic injuries. All lanes grid two eight A. Engine Seven One. Fire Attack Bravo. So I think that some of that's um, important for a little bit of backstory. You know, uh, those of us that work pre-hospital, both on the air and ground side, we don't get to see that. You know, that's heavy. Like I, you know, I've heard that 50 times making this presentation, and I still get goosebumps, especially at the end, where you can just hear this like release for that father is just like, oh my God, I need help, please, somebody help me. Um, and I think we forget about a lot of that stuff. And you know, to a certain extent, obviously, it's important that we separate ourselves and 
that we're not you know all invest you know involved in and a lot of the emotions but um, I think you know it, it is also still important you know we're human and we have to think about some of that stuff um, as we're giving care we're giving care to somebody that's for somebody's everything you know this kid is is his parents everything so just I think it's important we don't forget about that um, so um, we're heading to this call. It was about a 12-minute ETA. That was the map from the, you know, that was our response there. So it was about a 12-minute ETA, nothing super crazy. Um, this was the radio traffic. Uh, our ground guys give us a bit of a clinical report. So that's the one. Male. He has a probably six inch uh, behind his left ear. He is currently conscious, alert, oriented, crying. Um, so talk to me about what some of your guys' thoughts are in route to calls like this. You can just shout it out. Anybody have any thoughts that go through your mind? Yeah, so that's a good one. Pre-planning, for sure. That's kind of what I was my, my biggest thing. Um, one of the pieces that I brought up earlier was this was the first time that I had ever worked with um, my partner, um, and you know that in and of itself can bring up some challenges, some uh, barriers to potential care, or maybe not barriers, but just it's uncomfortable. You know, when you work with somebody that you've worked with for you know ten years, it's like nothing. You know, they're your left hand, you're their right. You know, you both are always thinking the same thing. Um, when you work with somebody different, obviously it's a little different. You know, it's you're fumbling over each other, you're tripping over things, and you just aren't as cohesive. And I think that's just natural, no matter who it is that you're with. I think the heavier your crew is, because I know the kid's 18 months, around eight, you know, we just, or 19 months, a year and a half, so you can kind of start flipping that page and, and thinking through what do you need. Absolutely. That's like, and that was the, the other biggest thing here. So in route, you know, we're kind of discussing what some of those things are that we're that you know we're planning on doing what you know what we think that we're going to show up to what interventions we think we need to do hey i you know in this if this this is what happens or if this is what presents itself these are the medications that we're going to use or, or whatnot um it, the last lecture yeah yeah yes i was on the helicopter yes um so on the way there, one big thing that um, in MedTrans we really preach is, you know, pre-planning our drugs. So like I'll always, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do the same thing, but put a nice piece of tape here and pull up a, a reference app or use a reference tool, um, no matter what it is, whether it's hand heavy, Broslo, the, you know, critical app, PD, whatever your, you know, your thing is, as long as you've vetted it and made sure that that's what, you know, is appropriate. Um, I think that's a super important to the, to part to this. If you don't do that, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Um, who here knows what size ET tube you do on a 19 month old just off the top of your head? I couldn't tell you. Um, so I think that kind of stuff is super, super important. Um, so the next couple of slides, we're gonna kind of go through a systematic approach to things. Um, if you're a paramedic, I think we a lot of the times use that general impression or what your swap, your sex, weight, age, activity, position. If, if you're a nurse, a lot of the times we think about that TNCC, what's the across the room assessment that you're seeing. Um, so for pediatrics, we utilize the uh, pediatric assessment trend. I think Sarah, if you wanted to. This is across the room observation, right? So something that was told to me a long time ago is that if you notice something, it's abnormal. And if you think about it, think about going breathing. How many times do we think, what was the gesture rate? I don't know. I didn't count it because I didn't recognize it, right? But if your person sitting next to you is breathing fast or slow or loud, you're going to pick up on that. So usually with breathing, especially, is if you notice it, it's abnormal, right? Um, so we do this walking down the, the, the aisles in the grocery store. If someone is walking beside you and they're breathing loud or, or they look bad, you know if they're sick or not sick from that moment. So you guys all do this very naturally. It's just kind of puts it into words what we do every single day. So. If it's a two-year-old and they're just lying there limp in mom's arms, is that okay? Are they are they neurologically normal? No. Um, is their work of breathing? Is it normal? Is it not normal? Are they are they not breathing at all? Because we all know that stillness of not breathing, right? I mean, you never realize how much someone moves until they're not moving, and you're like, oh, you move a lot when you breathe. 
Um, and then your circulation, what's your skin color? Are they blue, mottled, pale? What do they look like? So this is going to just basically your sick versus not sick. You guys have all done this. Every call you go on, it just kind of puts it more into a, a, a nice triangle shape. I was going to say square, but I mean a triangle. So this kid, when you got there, talking about what he looked like. Yeah, so we uh, landed, we got into the back of the ambulance, and kind of our across the room assessment is we see a very loud, chaotic environment. There's six or seven firefighters in the back of this ambulance. Uh, everybody's kind of yelling over each other. The child is screaming his you know head off, as you would imagine. Uh, so uh, you kind of are in that like sensory overload for a half a second, and you have to sit back and say like, whoa, what the heck are we doing? Um, so prior to us getting there, uh, the fire crews were not able to get any vital signs on this patient other than a heart rate. I think they had the floor lead on, so they had it, he was tachycardic at like 190. Um, they had given two intranasal doses of Versed to try to calm him, and they weren't super, uh, super effective um, in doing so. But uh, just looking at our pediatric assessment triangle, um, his appearance, he had good muscle tone. It wasn't like he was limp laying there. Um, his work of breathing, was rapid but adequate, um, and then circulation. His uh, his skin color was pink. He was uh, alert, you know, agitated as as you would imagine. Um, looks uncomfortable. So, what do you guys think? Just when you look at that triangle, do you think sick, not sick? Kind of a tricky one, right? I would say, you know, my initial impression when I looked, and it's hard, you know, I know it's hard to kind of picture this, but. Uh, my initial impression when I got there is like, sick, obviously, you know, he's got a knife sticking out of his head. This is, you know, not good, but like, eh, he's, he's all right. Like, he's doing doing all right. It's not like he's laying there, like, guppy breathing, um, you know, almost lifeless. So uh, I think when we think about kids, you know, crying is always a really good sign, they say, right? So, you know, this kid was crying his head off. So I'm like, all right, we got some time. You know, we don't have to, we're doing good. Um, so then as we go through our primary assessment, so our airway, um, right now he's screaming. He's maintaining a patent airway. It was not like he's, you know, again, vomiting or guppy breathing. It's not like we need to, oh my gosh, we need to rush to intubate this kid right this second. His breathing, um, rapid, but relatively um, unremarkable as far as his breathing assessment goes. Um, his lung sounds were clear and equal bilaterally. Um, one of the things that you think about in kids is some of those differences when we talk about um, uh, uh, airway and breathing. Um, so what are some of the big differences you think about when you think about breathing with kids? Anybody think of anything? How about size? Just size. Like some of you like Sarah or I have big lungs, right? You know, we keep 500 ml is a tidal volume or whatever it is. Like, you know, we have, a, a, you know, you can squeeze a bag and you could, you know, you're not supposed to squeeze the whole bag, obviously, but, you know, you could do that and, okay, you're really inflating those lungs. Um, when you think about kids, uh, that's not necessarily the case, right? Um, kids have really, really small lungs. So they have a low functional residual capacity, which is the amount of air that's still in the lungs after we exhale. Um, that means, though, that as if we're going to intubate or do any of these big airway or respiratory interventions, they're very prone to desaturations very quickly. Um, so we have to be really careful. One of the ways that we can combat that is through a systematic approach to like pre-oxygenation and ventilation for these kids during that pre-RSI phase. Um, one of the ways that we kind of uh, train to do this is we administer ketamine because um, we you know, want to maintain that uh, intact respiratory drive. Um, we want to position appropriately. That's like super, super important in children. Um, and we'll talk about it a little more later, but um, that helps increase the amount of capacity for uh, airway exchange or air exchange. Um, and then we'll use a, a nasal cannula as we intubate to provide uh, passive oxygenation, bump that all the way up to 15, 25, um, so that we're delivering oxygen as we're um, intubating the, the patient. Um, and then I think they talked a little bit in the last lecture too about um, just basic like BLS stuff. Um, with children, there's been a, lots of studies that have been performed that have uh, talked about the importance of uh, just BLS airway maneuvers. Um, do I think that we need to take that out of like the scope of transport providers uh, or ALS interventions like uh, intubation? Uh, absolutely not. But I think that it's really, really important to emphasize the importance of a lot of those BLS maneuvers like using uh, oral airways, nasal airways, um, just uh, adequate bagging. Like who's sat there and just bagged a child for like, 
20 minutes. I mean, that's like a hard skill. I mean, even adults, you know, really bagging is to, to perfect the skill of bagging is pretty, pretty different. It's not just sitting there, you know, squeezing the bag every six seconds. You know, you're having to maintain an adequate seal um, with two people, you know, optimally, uh, adequately position and tilt the airway back, uh, all those things. Make sure you're, you know, doing the crab claw uh, bagging techniques so that we're not overventilating these patients. Um, one of the other big things with children is uh, overventilating can lead to what else? You guys know? Gastric distension. So that then hampers your ability to um, expand your lungs all the way and can you know impact cardiac output and all those different factors. So uh, kids definitely are very sensitive to that. So we need to be very conscious when we're when we're bagging these patients. Um, and circulation. Um, did I miss? Oops, I missed a cahoot. Sorry. Okay, so what initial concerns did you have? Oh. What initial concerns did you have based on this general impression when you first walked in the door of this patient? Okay, all right, good. I like these, yeah. So obviously head bleed, definitely a big concern here, right? We have major penetrating head trauma here. Uh, compensating now, we kind of talked about that. You're absolutely right. We you know, are okay right now, obviously not in the best shape, but uh, definitely okay, vital sign stability. That's a good thing, we need to, that also goes into that, uh, is this sick or not sick? Um, how long till badness, exactly. We know that kids, you know, they compensate really, really, really well until they don't, and they fall off that cliff. Pain management, definitely. Uh, not sick yet, potential for bleed. And knife would move, we're gonna talk about that one. That's like a huge, huge one. Whoever did that, that's a good one. Um, and then next. So what intervention can be utilized to combat the lower functional residual capacity in pediatrics while intubating? Okay, good. So I'm glad everybody picked the right one. So uh, definitely emphasis placed on the preparation and pre-oxygenation phases of the intubation if we decide to go down that route. Um, I tend to kind of align more with the performing the fastest RSI ever because you're just that good. Like, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, and then we have one. Okay. And then the circulation assessment. So uh, as we go through this, your primary assessment again. Uh, we talked about this kind of with the uh, pediatric assessment triangle, but um, you're looking at your heart rate, your heart, your your rhythm, uh, your rate, rhythm, and quality of uh, a peripheral pulse, um, your skin color, temperature, condition, all those different things. Um, with this kid, he was doing pretty pretty okay. He was sinus tac at 190. Uh, we could palpate distal pulses. Um, his skin was looking good. Uh, we obviously didn't have a blood pressure initially, but we ended up getting one, and it was fine. Um, what do we think about when we think about cardiac output um, in children? What's the equation for cardiac output? Does everybody remember? Heart rate times stroke volume, right? So in adults, we can compensate for a lower output by increasing both our rate and our stroke volume, right? Our heart can pump stronger and our rate can pump faster. Um, in pediatrics, that's one of those big differences is that they can't compensate through increasing their stroke volume. So the only way they can do that is by increasing their heart rate. On the same page? So, another Kahoot. Uh -oh. Oh, I missed it. So what vital sign gives you the most information about the patient's hemodynamic status, even though I spelled hemodynamics wrong? <laughs> okay. So with this, the most important vital sign you want to watch is your heart rate, right? Because you're talking about your chronic output is your stroke volume times your heart rate. If you monitor a kid's heart rate and nothing else, it will give you a lot of information. So if your kid ha is hypoxic, what's your heart rate going to do? Drop, drop, right? If your kid is seizing, what's your heart rate going to do? Go up, right? So that's your biggest indicator of what your hemodynamic status is. Now, the other thing that's important, yes. A blood pressure, we don't really focus too much on blood pressures. 
um, for two reasons. Number one is if you're not a pediatric specific team, a lot of times you don't have the right size equipment, right? Adults, you have small, medium, and large. For kids, you have, we have five Neo sizes and then four kid sizes, and they don't always fit right. Some are too long, some are too short, just kind of depends. Um, so instead of blood pressure, you look more at their perfusion. Do you have good peripheral pulses? I was a CBIC nurse before I became what I was in transport, and I was taught check pedal pulses in everybody. So if I have good pedal pulses, I am perfusing everything else in between, right? So it doesn't really matter what my more pulses are if I have good pedal pulses. Obviously, unless I'm looking at perfusion, one might just the other. Um, Restaurant rate is important, right? If it's two, I'm concerned. Now, are you more concerned if a kid is um, to get it, right? Or was it for them to are you? <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> you're breathing, but I'm afraid you're going to go slow. But once you start slowing down, bad news. And the pulse oximetry, I mean, that's a good trending tool, right? But really, you can leave a pulse ox on the, on the bed, and it's going to be SAS 86%. Mm -hmm. So that one, it's great for trending, but it's an absolute number in a, in a you know, in the grand scheme of things. Is it the most useful by itself? But it's really Do you guys have protocols where you do blood pressure? Those of you that do pre-hospital, that you do blood pressures and different under three? Do you do blood pressures and different under three? A lot of EMS systems, um, we, do, we do education for, they don't do blood pressure under three just because they're not, they're not, they don't have any equipment for it. So moving on, uh, we did our A, B, C. Next is D, disability. That includes like a detailed neuro assessment. So um, as we go through this, he was alert. Uh, GCS was like 14, 15, you know, agitated, but, uh, you know, for the most part, alert. Uh, his pupil sizes were three, uh, reacted bilaterally. Uh, we did a full neuro exam. Um, he had all of his, like, gross motor functions intact, no focal deficits, uh, no obvious, you know, deficits that we noted. Um, obviously, like, you know, it's kind of hard, I think. You know, when we th think about, like, uh, adults, like, what is, what's the big neuro call that we all do with adults? Strokes? Yeah, strokes. Like, and, like, we... You know, I think in a lot of those uh, patients, we have such a hard time getting like a really, really good neuro assessment or like we get there and we're, it's like so dire that we have to intubate them or whatever and we're not able to like really get a good neuro assessment. And then of course you get to the hospital and like that's the first thing you get bitched out about, right? Right, huh? <laughs> um, so you get in trouble. So um, I think that's something that's like super important to, to think about. Now the next Kahoot, I'll give you a hint, um, talks about uh, a neuro assessment on this patient. So what do we think um, we would see what what deficits will we look for? Okay. Um, what uh, based on the location of the injury, what deficits will we be looking for? Can you see the? Okay. Well, here. So we're kind of between these two is kind of the, we're a little bit all over, but for the most part between these two. So um, Sarah and I actually were even talking about this yesterday, and we were kind of going back and forth. Um, if you see on this diagram here, so the knife, I know you guys haven't really seen a picture, you'll see it next, but the knife was going through his ear right here. Um, so which area of the brain do we think that that looks at? Temporal, yeah, so we were kind of even going back and forth, and we were like, man, is that really the parietal the lobe or the temporal lobe? So we ended up thinking that was kind of more of the temporal lobe because it was really down, it was really through the ear. Um, mm -hmm. going up to, and how long is it? It's yeah. going from this side of the brain to this side of the brain, how you know big the head is, so it could be multiple weeks. Exactly. So if it was in the uh, temporal, brain, uh, temporal area, um, you look at language, memory, senses um, are the big things that that area uh, affects. And then if it extended up into the parietal area, um, you can look at like your senses, like touch, se uh, smell, taste, um, all those senses. And then if it went down, what do you really worry about too? What was that? 
Brain stem, yeah. So what is that control? That's like la oblongata, I remember. <laughs> uh, so all your vital functions, you know, your temperature regulation, your breathing center, your pons in there, your uh, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, so that could have been like catastrophic um, for sure. So this is a picture of little Benjamin. Um, so we went down to our exposure. Um, so we do A, B, C, D, E. Um, we completely undressed him to look for um, any other injuries. Uh, the biggest thing, obviously, was this uh, big steak knife that's entering his head, uh, kind of funny enough or funny enough. Uh, when we got there, the fire crews didn't even think it was going into his brain. They were like, oh, I think it's just under his skin. And I was like, ah, OK, thanks for calling. <laughs> Um, but it was they were they were good. I don't think that as a thrown shade. Um, obviously, he was agitated, and whoever brought up the need to stabilize, that was our biggest challenge with him. Was he's you know obviously freaking out, so he's moving his head around like this, and the firefighter that's holding the knife, it's like going like this, and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so um, big, definitely probably our biggest concern when we first got there. Um, and then you think about this, like the story was originally. Um, that he was uh, sitting in a chair, he fell over and fell on the knife, basically. Who's been in a, I mean, does anybody have kids here? Or everybody was a kid, like, which one of you thinks that like a kid would fall onto a knife that would go into his head? Like super sketchy, right? Um, so the dad was actually in the back of the ambulance with us when we got there as well. And so we'll bring that up a little bit later, but um, that's the other biggest thing with this exposure uh, slide is, we want to make sure that we're undressing like every trauma patient, trauma naked, cover them back up to keep them warm. Um, look for any other signs of uh, injury. Look at, you know, the uh, Sarah's going to talk a little bit more about uh, indicators for non-accidental trauma. But um, this is, to me, a very sketchy story. Um, want to make sure that this isn't just a distracting injury, that there's not a big pelvis fracture that you're missing or a big new tension pneumo or, you know, anything that's tr truly life-threatening. Uh, so our plan. So, you know, you have this, like, where do you go from there, right? I mean, that's kind of was our uh, our internal quandary on this call. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we um, decided initially that we were going to try to sedate him. So figure out some way to sedate him, whether it was permanently or was, whether it was temporarily to try to figure out, like, kind of where to go from, you know, like, let's get this under control. Let's get him not thrashing about. Let's stabilize this knife, and then we can go from there. So we administered two doses of uh, IM ketamine. He didn't have any vascular access at this point. And we looked real quick, weren't able to find a spot for a line, uh, figured we probably should sedate him before we think about like an IO on this kid that's already losing his mind. You know. Um, so now what? Well, that was, um, now is another Kahoot. Now what? Now time for a Kahoot. <laughs> So we talk about secondary brain injury. Is everybody familiar with that concept? What are some of our goals for prevention of secondary brain injury in this patient? OK, good, good. I'm glad we're all on the same page. So um, biggest like you know, neurocritical care kind of tip or, or uh, little tidbit would be that our goals of care for traumatic brain injury patients is prevention of secondary brain injury. We're all on the same page there. Um, so the, some of those biggest things that we talk about that are like the key components to that are preventing your big H bombs, your hypoxia and hypotension and uh, hydrogen ion acidosis. Uh, so those are like the three biggest things. You know, you can go into like hyper and hypoglycemia as well. But um, those are, I think, those three biggest things that we can um, fix working EMS uh, that we can prevent. Okay, almost there. So at this point, what are your thoughts on controlling an airway? What do we think? Okay, we were tied, seven and seven. All righty. So um, this was what we kind of, we were, you know, stuck there. We talked about it afterwards, and, you know, we, we initially kind of 
you know, gave some IM ketamine to try to sedate, you know, in retrospect, probably, I mean, yeah, it was good because it got us to the point that we were able to intubate, but really we probably were, and I think we were, but uh, we should have been thinking, hey, let's do this in an effort to get towards intubation. Um, so we it did end up uh, uh, intubating the child. Um, our thoughts again were uh, preventing, you know, further harm and transport. Um, we're kind of blunting some of that sympathetic surge, so it's you know neuroprotective in, in a certain way. Um, but we ended up intubating with these uh, agents: some ketamine, fentanyl, and rock. Um, afterwards, obviously, you guys are all uh, professionals, so you know confirming placement by end title is super super important. If you don't have end title, you don't have a tube, right? Um, and then securement. Um, does anybody know? Does everybody here use those Thomas tube holders? No? Is that what, so about half and half? Does anybody know what that tube holder actually goes down to, even the pediatric one? What size tube? 4.5. 4 so, like, that leaves a lot of room for error, right? <laughs> like, so I don't remember which size uh, tube we ended up using on him. I think it was a four, actually. Um, so, we did end up having to tape this tube, but there's like methods for taping tubes. So, you have to be really, really careful um, in the securement part of this because, again, accidental dislodgements happen all the time and are super common in kids. Um, what are our thoughts on atropine? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Pre-medication for atropine? So working with the folks at um, Johns Hopkins down in, in Florida, um, they regularly use atropine as a pre-medication for um, young children. Uh, I think the recommendation is infants under one always use it for the most part. Um, you're blunting that uh, vagal uh, stimulation that can happen with laryngoscopy. Um, and then kind of it's a consideration more with kids one to five. We didn't end up doing it on him. We didn't have um, any uh, bra uh, bradycardic episodes during intubation, which was good. But obviously, that could have been really bad because, you know, we talk about the uh, avoiding hypotension. And, you know, cardiac output is super, super dependent on that rate in children. So that uh, was definitely another learning point that we probably should have just better safe than sorry with him. So indications for intubation. Um, I think that we're all pretty, again, everybody in this room um, are pretty high high speed. So I don't think I need to um, hit this super hard, but um, I'll just go over it for the sake of the presentation. Um, GCS less than eight, you know, intubate. I think this is like a relative more for me than it is like an absolute all the time. I think we always preach that saying because it sounds really cool, but think about how many postdictal patients that we run on on 911 calls out in the streets that we're not intubating every postdictal patient, right? So I think relative for sure. Um, obviously, unable to protect or maintain control of their own airway, inability to, to oxygenate or ventilate, that's super important. Uh, one thing that I learned when I transitioned from being a ground medic to a flight medic was the safety in flight. Like, I think we do a lot more of these, um, like safety intubations um, when, we, when you get to the, the flight level, which is, was interesting to me. And then expected clinical course. So um, I think little Benjamin kind of fell into some of these, like a couple of these maybe. Uh, Maybe the safety during transport, maybe the expected clinical course uh, kind of overlap with some of those. Um, so, so some of our pediatric airway differences, um, just to kind of review some of these things with you. Uh, peds, obviously, that's one of the biggest differences with peds, right? When they say, you know, peds aren't just little adults. Um, we think about a lot of these differences uh, between the two. Um, and some of these anatomic differences can make even... Uh, intubating a kid uh, even challenging for the most difficult, or most experienced, I'm sorry, intubator out there. Um, so we look at um, the smaller larynx, obviously, not a lot of room, um, the big floppy tongue, big floppy epiglottis, uh, which is the reason that a Miller blade is most commonly used or recommended in children. Um, the large occiputs, so the large backs of their heads make them prone to kind of doing this, so it's hard to maintain that sniffing position. Um, a way that we can uh, address that is putting towel rolls under their shoulders. Another thing, when you have like smaller kids, even a towel can be too much. So um, does anybody have ideas on that, how we can boost those shoulders up in smaller kids? Anybody? Pillowcase, that's a, that's a good one. I haven't thought about that one. Um, what we use a lot is uh, four by fours. Just get like a stack of four by fours um, for, again, smaller kids, but kind of kind of a useful tool. Um, and then the shorter neck, I think, is another thing that's like super undervalued or uh, not appreciated or not thought of when we talk about intubating children. Um, shorter necks lead to easier dislodgements, um, whether it be like a dislodgement from uh, neck flexion or right mainstem intubation from uh, 
from the like kind of chin to chest movements. Um, so does anybody like have in their protocols um, putting C collars on these patients, even if they're non-traumatic patients to prevent dislodgements? Just something to think about. It's something that we do uh, pretty regularly to help, help prevent dislodgements. So. Um, now transport considerations. So we've got the kid intubated, um, did our rapid head to toe, we're good to go. We've addressed all of our li immediate life threats. Um, now what? So we secured the knife, um, kind of made things pretty, tried to clean him up as much as we could um, and carefully uh, transfer him over to our stretcher. Again, every move is like one of the highest risk points of the transport process, right? Whether it be from an intubate, ex like accidental excavation, whether it be a knife in the head. Um, so I think always putting emphasis on that and communicating with your team is super, super important. You know, always the person at the head is calling it and we're calling it on three, not after three or you know whatever nuance um, you want to go with. Um, it's kind of a funny part of the story. Again, like you know, you don't know your partners really super well. So my partner had been like, "Oh yeah, let's bring the dad along." And I was like, "Heck no, man! What?" <laughs> so uh, just kind of funny, you know. It was really quickly addressed, like not a big deal, but it was just uh, just just kind of funny. Um, as, again, some other transport considerations here. We're trying to prevent H-bombs, uh, prevent those, that secondary brain injury. Um, as far as ventilatory supports, just some thoughts um, about, uh, about general leg ventilation for this kid. Uh, obviously, we want to use lower tidal volumes. We want to you know, not squeeze that whole bag, just that small little uh, crab claw bagging, as we call it, to, enough to see the chest rise. Um, airway positioning, again, super important for this patient, both in the actual intubation process and the pre-ox process, because we want to make sure that we're getting as much gas exchange to combat that lower functional residual capacity. Um, and then considering the use of pressure control ventilation um, while we're putting him on our ventilator. We put our, every patient on the vent every time uh, so that we have extra hands. Um, and I think a ventilator just, there's, you're not going to get any better ventilation than from a ventilator um, but when you're bagging. We also administered some additional fentanyl for him um, during the transport. Um, I think that analgesia is super, super important. Um, and that should be the first part of your like sedation bundle um, for these kiddos or for patients in general, um, instead of jumping straight to uh, additional sedatives. Um, you gotta be really careful obviously with benzos um, because you worry about hy uh, hypotension, which again is kind of one of those H bombs that we talked about. We're trying to avoid it. And then not necessarily for us, but we look at like later on uh, benzos really contribute to delirium and ICU delirium, and I think that's something that's again super undervalued when we talk about um, uh, when we talk about our roles. Uh, we're going to skip this kahoot so that we can get going, um, and we're not falling behind. Here, let me do this. Ooh, how's this thing go on? That's what a pocket. What's happening? <laughs> Okay. All right. So the patient's been stabilized. He's been intubated for protection, and he's brought to the hospital. So when he gets to the hospital, this is what we find. We find a child intubated with a, with a knife sticking through his ear. Um, this kind of shows you a little bit of a close-up of this right here. Sorry for the quality, but you kind of see his ear is folded up. So it went under his ear and kind of pinned his earlobe into his ear. In the trauma room, he became hypotensive, tachycardic, so he had to address his ABCs first, right? So he got some fluid, he got some blood, his hypotension resolved, um, he remained tachycardic. What caused that is multi-factor, right? And then he was taken to CT. So we did an X-ray, this is the X-ray, that just shows the knife in the head, right? So it kind of shows, if you look, we talked about where in the brain it affects, Given the size of his brain, which was about right here-ish, um, it went pretty far into it, okay? So it could have hit several parts of his brain. The good thing is, is when you're 19 months versus when you're, you know, 90 years old, you have a really plastic brain. Like it really grows and it's moldable, which is, which is good for long-term outcomes. Um, we did a CT angiogram. So this is a CT angiogram. So all the white stuff, is all blood flow. So that's good, right? The brain has a lot of blood flow. You want to keep the blood flow there. But it doesn't show any bleeds per se. So every, if you kind of look at it from afar, you see there's no big air besides the outside. There's no big areas of a lot of blood blooming or a lot of blood in there. This right here is just the artifact from the knife itself. 
So how did we treat him? What did we do? What was our next step from a hospital perspective? What do you guys think? That would be the logical step, right? But when you're a neurosurgeon and you've decided there's no bleeding, you just pull the knife out and CT scanner. I mean, that makes sense, right? So they had an OR ready, um, but the, the Dr. Jalo was in the scanner. So he's one of our um, neuro neurosurgeons. So he just pulled it out, pulled the knife out, said scan him again. I do not recommend this in the field. You should never do this on your own. If he if he broke it, he had to fix it. So he has the skills to fix it. So if you don't have the skills to fix it, don't break it. All right. So keep it in there. We want to make sure there's no bleeding. So we just scanned him again. And he was actually very lucky. You see the little black dots here are just a little bit of air. And this is a little bit of blood. So from that knife going in, wherever angle it came in, he really didn't have a lot of injury, right? It was actually really kind of contained to one part of his brain, which was really good. So if you're a neurosurgeon, you pull the knife out. If you're not a neurosurgeon, just leave it, leave it be. Um, so then it gets to the point that you had earlier. What really happened, right? You always want to think if this is a really odd situation. You know, kids don't usually stab themselves in the head. Think of how much force it took to stab a knife through the, I'm not, there's bones in here, I'm sure, that need to go through, um, even though it's through the ear. So that's a lot of force. We talked about exposing the patient to make sure there's nothing else going on. Did, did someone do something to him? So we want to we wanna ask their history, right? And people that do in the ER of um, non-tertiary care centers, in EMS, the police, it's very important that you document exactly what was said, right? In quotation marks, because the way people usually get caught is their stories are inconsistent. Okay, so when you're getting history, the things you want to look for are like, how long did it take them to call 911? Did they bring them to the ER directly or did they call 911 to come to their home? What does their home look like, right? I'm not talking about a messy home, but like, does it look dangerous? Is there needles flying around? Those kind of things. Um, is there previous DCF involvement? You guys aren't going to know this, but that's one of the high risk factors. Um, the other thing is, is that it was unwitnessed or the injury doesn't match the child's developmental age. So if they say the three week all old rolled off the bed on their own, it's not that that's not feasible because the three week old doesn't roll. And if they do, it's like from back to front. You know what I mean? It's not off the bed. Versus he was on the side of the bed I sat down, he rolled off. That's a much more plausible story, but just does do the two things match. Um, then when you look at radiographic findings, if you're doing inner facility, you ha you can read the reports, right? I'm terrible at reading x-rays, but I can read a report really well, and I can kind of pick up on some of the things. So um, any fracture in a non-ambulating infant, so unless they have osteogenesis imperfecta or something like that, they shouldn't really have bone fractures, right? They're, they shouldn't be falling off of anything. We had a baby just last week that I'm still trying to figure out the mechanism behind him, but he she was in bed, a two-day-old was in bed, with mom in the hospital. Mom fell asleep and the baby rolled off the bed. It's a newborn, right? But she had fractures on every side of her head. She had parietal, occipital, um, temporal, and it's like, from one fall, how does that really happen, you know? So those stories don't really make sense. And sometimes we may never know, right? But sometimes we do. So kind of um, the spiral fractures, any undiagnosed healing fractures. So once you come in the hospital, and you are assessed for non accidental trauma or abuse, there's a very specific algorithm we follow. So we do all your trauma labs, your coags, your electrolytes. Um, we do a skeletal survey. So we take an X-ray of every bone in your body beside your skull, unless you have a head injury, to see are there old healing fractures. So if you have a, a kid that has no history of fractures, yet you see all of these, these um, fractures that are healed, well, that brings up a question of, you know, very, very rarely there's osteogenesis perfecta where they have or, or some kind of kids on long-term TPN and those kind of things have osteoporosis, so they're going to break easier. But those are very rare. You shouldn't have fractures in different stages of healing, right? That's, that's really an unusual finding. So they all get skeletal surveys to look and see. The other thing we look at when we do the, um, the NAT workup is we get an ophthalmologist under two years of age. 
We get an ophthalmologist look at your eyes. We're looking for retinal hemorrhages. If they're newborns, they're not the greatest tool because you can get retinal hemorrhages from birth. I think like 35% of babies have retinal hemorrhages at birth. Um, but if you're shaken, you will have retinal hemorrhages. So we always get an ophthalmologist to look at them. A torn frenulum. So your frenulum is that thing that connects your gums to your lips. If that is torn, it's a very high suspicion of abuse. It's usually from forceful feeding. They're shoving a bottle in their mouth and tearing those. Or um, bruising or injury on the pinna of your ear. So that is a, I think it's something like 94% linked to abuse cases. Because it's, you don't usually fall and hurt the pinna of your ear, right? You're hurting your head. Um, so that's very rare. Usually people from pulling their ears and guiding them or picking up by their ears. Um, circumferential burns or pattern burns, with the exception of a lot of these um, like cupping and um, coining and those kind of uh, cultural practices, most injuries are not in any type of pattern or source, right? Like you don't have a nice circular burn usually in multiple places unless it's someone did that to you. It's very rare. or these teenagers, there's a really, really high incidence right now of suicide attempts and self-harm, so they could be burning themselves. But a small kid that has circumferential or pattern burns, we want to worry about. Um, adult bite marks. Kids bite each other all the time. Adults should not bite kids and leave marks on them. That's bad. So if they have big bite marks, then you want to kind of worry about that. All right. Oh, go back. Will you do the, uh, the question? One more Kahoot. Sorry, I skipped it. All right. Okay. What is the what do you like least about pediatric patients? What do you like least for caring for them? It's always the answer. I love this. The exact answer I'm looking for. See what other things you guys don't like about them. Does everybody in this room better know what this gift is? This yeah. <laughs> Fancy sauce? <laughs> oh, so I can skip that. Go skip. A minute when you are typing in the program seems like not very long, but as I'm standing up here, a minute seems like a really long. All right, so small people, okay, everything smaller, parents, family. Emotionally, it's hard, and I think being in pediatrics for 20 years, you have to, if you're going to be successful, and you have to learn to not take on the emotions of everybody. Once I had kids, I have two little kids, I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, it became much harder because I can now I can now relate a little more. So that, that to me is a little bit harder. Um, meds. Meds are hard. There's a lot of math in pediatrics. Tools are great. Um, there's a lot of meds. All right. But parents and caregivers are usually what people hate most. Why do you, why do you dislike the parents and caregivers? What about them do you not like? Perfect. So they want what they want, right? They have their own agenda. They are, they, they know how their kid is. But if you ever sit back and watch, you guys probably don't get, you probably don't get the benefit that we get of watching interactions of people. And doing this for a long time, the, the, the way I find to really have parents be helpful is use them. Listen to them, make them feel hurt. They may be crazy as can be. And you just say, yes, thank you for the input. Or I find the words that are very helpful is, even if you don't believe it, right? This is your child. You know them better than I do, right? You have, you know them. I just am seeing them for a second. So it's very helpful and kind of not that tug of war. It's my child. It's my patient. It's my child. It's my patient. And parents are helpful. Ask things like, what makes them happy? Even if they're gorked out babies that don't do anything because they don't do anything, what makes them happy? And you may, that may be very helpful for you when you have a screaming kid in the back of your aircraft or ambulance, but they want, I don't know, they like their head patted or rubbed or whatever it is might be very helpful for you. So if you make it not a tug of war and a joint effort of 
making them the partnership, ask them what works. These, these kids that are really chronic, what worked last time? You know what? Because it might work again. And that's going to help me better take care of this patient. So use them. Try and view them more as a partner than they are truly against you. Because most of them aren't. They want what's best for their patient or for their child. And if, you, if they say, I only want this, and you explain to them why you want to do B, like, hear them out. Okay, I know that worked last time, but I want to try this because A, B, and C, 98% of the time, they're going, you're going to have a much better experience. And so will they. And they'll have a lot more trust for you. All right. So this is Benjamin. This is two days later. So the knife came out. He spent the night in the ICU. And two days later, he's running around the floor and he looks great, right? Isn't he adorable? He old Benjamin. So we did a lot of talk. We talked about the, looking at abuse and that kind of thing. And after spending a lot of time with the parents, like me and Nick went down and probably spent an hour with them one day. Um, I, there was no, in DCF investigation, I mean, we went through the whole process and there was no foundings of abuse at all. You know, the dad tells this terrifying story as he was doing the dishes. Um, Benjamin was standing on a chair next to the countertop. He grabbed a knife that dad didn't even know was there. And your toddlers are unsteady. And they don't know if he was trying to climb down or what he was doing. He turned to see him fall and he literally fell on the knife. And if you look at the trajectory of the knife, it makes sense, right? That's really good. Does it make sense? And this one did. So there is no suspicion of abuse, even though it was a weird injury, talking to the family. I mean, mom was telling us a story about how she was trying to drive up to the scene and she sees a helicopter taking off with her child. And, you know, that's the part we don't get a lot of interaction with is how do the parents feel? And although that should not be your prime, your prime priority, it should be one of the things you think about because it's going to make their experience better. It's going to make your experience better. Like we had a great relationship with these, with this family, you know, and they're like, one day you're going to want to use this for a presentation. Yep, we sure will. So here we are. And dad told us that one day we're going to get a phone call that says you want to use this story. And we did. They have not seen the pictures of the knife in his head, nor do they want to. I don't blame them at all. So, but it was very interesting hearing their side of the story. So I, I challenge you to try and hear the parent side of the story because it will make your experience with pediatrics much better and it'll make the patient happier and it will also make the parents feel that their kid got the best care.